Good afternoon, everyone. I was told that I had to introduce myself because there wasn't going to be anybody up here to introduce me. <laughs> so I'm Ileana Pena, I'm the Associate Chief of Cardiology at Montefiore uh, Einstein. We are the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I'm a professor of medicine and epidemiology, and I eat, breathe, and sleep heart failure which is what I've been doing for over 20 years. And so I know you are not uh, the only ones that have never seen heart failure before. You probably have it coming out of your ears, like every other hospital in the country. 
and you're probably dealing with readmission rates that your administration really doesn't like because you're sending money back to Medicare every year. And depending upon how bad your numbers are, like ours were, you can be sending back 3% of Medicare earnings, which is a lot of money when you're talking about a big hospital. So I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Residents, raise your hand. Medical students? Nurses? Pharmacists? Physical therapists? OT. See, I even know OT. How about attendings? I saw some that got their platters and walked out and tell their, those who are attendings. But I give you a lot of credit because my, my fellows and my residents usually sit in the back of the room. It's like just like grade school, so you can get out quickly. And so kudos to you for sitting up front. I'm the one that's always yelling at them to sit up front. So if there's something you don't understand, if there's something that's not clear, please let me know. Because like I said, I do this every day and I probably take some things for granted. To give you an idea, we have 2,483 admissions for decompensated heart failure in our institution per year. That's three hospitals in the Bronx. And when I first got there, the readmission rate was 28%. The readmission rate around the country is about 19.6. So we were in very serious trouble when I got there. And you'll, you'll see when I talk about it more that it's also very regional. Um, you, can, you can take a look at a map in a state and you can get a number for the state. When you start to break it down, regions have their patterns. And sometimes clinicians go in between different hospitals in different areas and impart their wisdom and their care type within a region. But what the good news is, <clears throat> is that there is a lot that we can do and that we have a lot of great medications and we have devices that work. We do this every day. If you don't think about them, you'll never use them. But if you use them, you may be able to reverse about a third of the patients. And I mean reverse them. So one of my messages here is if you're the caregiver who's going to be looking or prescribing the meds, look every single time you see that patient because there's always something that you can do. But in order to understand what the medicines do, you gotta understand the disease process in itself. And when you look at the patient, you are really seeing the physiology that's going on right in front of you, and that is the physiology of the patient. So these are our objectives today. This is a CME course. These slides were put together by a bunch of us, friends of mine, colleagues in the heart failure world, and we got a grant so that we could do this as a CME course without bias and without um, potential conflicts of interest. I have no conflicts with anybody. So let's start out with the heart. And we still have the word CHF here, but I'm going to urge you to drop the C because it really isn't congestive heart failure anymore. It's heart failure. Because by the time the patient gets congested, they've had heart failure for a while. There are a lot of patients running around with heart failure who are not congested. It doesn't mean they don't have heart failure. But whatever limited the left ventricle, whether it's diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction, which we now call HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, those are the names today for systolic and diastolic dysfunction, the body has an amazing way of compensating. And as cardiac output drops, for whatever reason, whether it's high blood pressure of many years, or it's a problem with the heart muscle, or it's coronary artery disease with a myocardial infarction or without it, the neurohormonal cascade gets activated. And so when the patients first come in, we call it a storm, because that's essentially where they are. They're in a neurohormonal storm, which leads to a comp compensation, which is retention of water and salt. And with that, total peripheral resistance goes up. 
and the ventricle doesn't like high resistance. And so the cardiac output drops some more. So this becomes a vicious cycle. And as the patient enters that vicious cycle, they get progressively sicker. And then they end up with people like us who put in pumps and do transplants. And so we now talk about the stages of heart failure. Not just the New York Heart class, the stages of heart failure. Why did we add a stage A? Well, stage A is, are, is a patient who may have a lot of risk factors. And if you look at these risk factors, they should remind you of the risk factors for coronary disease. They're essentially the Framingham risk factors. And at this point, the heart looks okay, and the patient looks okay. But they're at risk. And they're at risk for developing heart failure, and that's stage A. There's New York heart class here, no New York class. They have no symptoms, it's, class, it's stage A. Then they have an event, whatever the event is, and now the ventricle doesn't look so hot, but the patient still looks decent. Why? Because they're compensating. And you can't be fooled. A compensation can fool you because when you look at them, they look okay. That's a stage B. They're already in trouble and we start treating, we don't wait. As the ventricle gets worse, and the patient gets more symptomatic, they become stage C and D, which is when we get them in the transplant group. So we are an advanced heart failure group. And now that we have new hypertension guidelines, and I hope if, if you haven't read them, they're 230 some pages. Read the executive summary, don't read the 230 some pages. But they're incredibly well written and they're free. So you can download them from the American Heart Association website, and they're absolutely free. And it's telling us for the first time, we've been telling patients this without data. I mean, I've been saying for years, if I can get your blood pressure down, I have a 50% chance of reducing your chances of having heart failure. Now we've got the proof. We have the SHIFT trial uh, who told us that if we could reduce the blood pressure below 130, really close to 120, we could reduce heart failure by 50%. We could reduce the first myocardial infarction. So now we have the proof that in fact what we've been saying for years is very real. And knowing that many of my heart failure patients have had hypertension somewhere along the way, and you are in a hypertension area rich here, you're in the south, you're in the Bible Belt, you're in the cigarette belt, you're in the coronary belt. I'm from Florida, so I know these belts fairly well. These patients are at high risk. And so now, for heart failure, in our guidelines, we say to the patients, we want your blood pressure below 130. And most of my patients run around with blood pressures in the 90s and low hundreds, and that's where I want them, and that's where I like them, nicely decompressed. And how do we do that? By up titrating the medications. Don't be afraid of the drugs. Those neurohormones that I told you about, there are many of them. Norepinephrine, which is made by what? The sympathetic nervous system, right? Plasma renin, renin made by the kidneys. Renin, renin is what babies make <laughs> in their mouth. This is renin in, in the whole system. Arginine vasopressin, which when I was in school, we used to call it ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Its real name is arginine vasopressin because it doesn't just retain water, it's a vasoconstrictor. So it, it accounts for much of this systemic vascular resistance. The atrial natriuretic peptides, which we now look at brain natriuretic peptide or BMP, what do you have here in the hospital, BMP or pro-BMP? You have regular BMP, okay, we have pro-BMP. Most hospitals, if we start using some of the newer drugs, are gonna to switch to pro-BMP. And then endothelin, which we don't measure, but it is also a very powerful vasoconstrictor. And when the sympathetic nervous system turns on, norepinephrine and epinephrine are vasoconstrictors. They also impair sodium excretion by the kidneys, and it's part of the remodeling cascade of the ventricle. So a lot of the left ventricular hypertrophy that we see in hypertensives, 
who've been hypertensive for a long time is a result of the sympathetic nervous system. And again, I don't have to tell electrophysiologists, arrhythmias. When we give beta blockers, beta blockers are really the first line of defense of sudden death and of, and of significant ventricular arrhythmia. So we use a lot of beta blockers, and you'll hear me talk about that. And also with a lower potassium. So what do we do in the hospital? We give Lasix. We love to give Lasix. We give gobs and gobs of Lasix. And the patients drop their potassium, which makes them more vulnerable to arrhythmias. But I'm also going to talk about the opposite. I'm going to talk about high, high potassium as well. So here's what it looks like chemically. So angiotensinogen is a peptide. and in, in other words, it's made up of amino acids. It's not, it's not very big. But it gets broken down by renin, which is made by the kidney, to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is a decapeptide. It has 10 amino acids. And then along comes the angiotensin converting enzyme, the one that we block with ACE inhibitors, which you're all familiar with because the patients are on ACE inhibitors, to make angiotensin II, which is an octapeptide. It's eight amino acids. And angiotensin II works on receptors, AT1, AT2, 3, 4, and 5. But AT1 is the receptor on the cell membrane. It's bound to the cell membrane that causes all the bad stuff that angiotensin II does. Angiotensin II is a bad actor. And when we block the receptor with our ARBs, you know, Losartan, Valsartan, Candesartan, that's what you're doing. So when you're blocking the system up here with the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, you're giving them, I hope you're giving them an allopril, maybe lisinopril, and very often captopril when you're afraid of long-acting ACE inhibitors. That's, that's my, my, my route with the resonance. You're afraid? OK, I'll let you go with the short acting. I use an allopril. It's my, my favorite ACE inhibitor. And I don't own any stock in anybody. But the other thing that this enzyme does is it breaks down bradykinin. Bradykinin is for vasodilators. They also cause a cough in a percentage of patients. And they cause angioedema. So the angioedema and the cough of bradykinins you don't have with the ARBs. But today, the number one drug of choice for heart failure is an ACE inhibitor. Diuretic are not heart failure drugs. They're volume drugs. So part of my talk is about changing your mentality when you look at the medications. So here's angiotensin II right at the core of doing all these things. It's a vasoconstrictor. It activates the sympathetic nervous system. It raises aldosterone, a very important neurohormone that every day we learn more and more about it. Vasopressin, which we used to be ADH, endothelin, and it causes remodeling. Remodeling your kitchen looks better when you're done. Remodeling of the heart doesn't look so good when the remodeling is done. So think of remodeling as something not good. Hypertrophy, dilatation, not good. And it has a role in platelet aggregation, thrombosis. So sometimes when we do a biopsy of a heart with heart failure, you can see little thrombi in the capillaries. You know that that patient is under that neurohormonal bombardment. So what do I want to do as a clinician? And I see patients all the time. What do I want to do? Well. I want them to feel better, right? I think we all feel that who care for patients. We want them to have less symptoms. We want them to have a better health status. Health status includes quality of life, but it also includes things like social interactions, not just quality of life, and how much they can do. I want to improve their function. I don't want them sitting in a chair all day. I send everybody to exercise. I send them to cardiac rehab. Love cardiac rehab to get the patients moving. So if I can improve functional capacity and I can improve their symptoms, I'm getting somewhere. And obviously, I want them to live longer. But our patients don't know Kaplan-Meier curves. We know those numbers. They want to feel better. And they hate being in the hospital. 
I don't know any patient who is doing fairly okay who wants to be stuck in the hospital. And they hate it when I say, did you bring your toothbrush in your pajamas? Because I'm going to stick you in. They hate it. So we fight to try to keep the patients out of the hospital, but doing it safely. There are some sick patients that very much belong in the hospital. For example, somebody who can't sleep at night because they can't lie flat. And I have patients who put pillows on a wall and sit up or, or in a recliner to be able to breathe. Those people belong in the hospital. That, that's not a way to live. And it's also a syndrome that we need to be proactive. You don't wait until the patient gains 20 pounds of water. I want to know about three pounds, five pounds. And we train the patients, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So we're going to deal with the syndrome depending upon what the physiology is underneath. So we want to protect the myocardium. We want to protect the heart muscle. We do that with the RAS inhibitors. RAS stands for renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So we do that with the ACEs, the ARBs, spironolactone, and we do that with the beta blockers. We want to improve hemodynamics. Everybody, when I was in medical school, used to use digoxin. I can't remember the last time I put anybody on digoxin because the mortality trial was negative. I have some colleagues that still believe that digoxin improves pump function. But at this point, it's very cheap. It's 10 cents a tablet. But I find some of my you know, longer working colleagues are still using DIG. Most of us don't use DIG. Diuretics are for the treatment of volume. That's what they do. They treat volume. Hydralazine and nitrates, vasodilators, like the drug Vital. Do you have it on formulary? Do you have Vital on formulary? Yes, no, maybe? Where's the pharmacist? Some of you raised your hands. You don't have Vital on the formulary. Okay, so that's the combination of hydralazine and isosorbide all together in one pill. We we, separate you use them separately, even though there's, there's a letter saying to the FDA that the separate ones don't work. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> So we also want to prevent coronary events. You want to prevent myocardial infarction. You want to prevent ischemia. And how do we do that? We use statins. We use antiplatelet agents, namely aspirin, clopidogrel, aspirin, prasugrel. And we send patients to PCI. You have an active cath lab here. So we do PCIs and we do bypass surgery to revascularize and bring blood back to the myocardium. And then we prevent arrhythmias. First line of prevention. It's not the ICD, it's a beta blocker. But we still give ICDs when appropriate, right? So whenever we have a plan with these patients, and I try to set up a plan with every patient, my post-discharge clinic is run by pharmacists. And I'm just there to be there in case the patient doesn't look good. But we plan a treatment strategy by dividing them up, whether they have diastolic dysfunction or HEFPEF, or reduced ejection fraction, HEFREF. And if they have HEFREF, we have tons of medications that we can use, and good drugs, and cheap drugs. Some of the newer ones are very expensive, and I'll, I'll tell you the prices of each of them. And then for HEFPEF, we don't have that big blockbuster drug but we think spironolactone is pretty darn good. And we know that if we treat the comorbidities like the blood pressure, the patients do better. So we're still looking for that blockbuster drug for HEFPEF, which right now we don't have. So if the patient is retaining fluid, of course you want to use a diuretic. But you have to use diuretics intelligently, not just blasting. Try to figure out how much volume the patient really has. If you take one of these HEFPEF patients and you give them the 140, 160 of Lasix, they may drop their blood pressure because all they needed was a little bit of fluid off. Whereas you have a HEFREF patient, you may want to get the three and five liters out. But it doesn't have to happen immediately. It happens across time. Atrial fibrillation is very interesting. There's growing interest in atrial fibrillation because now we're doing ablations. You guys doing ablations here for AFib? Even though we don't know yet if that's better 
than treating and only ablating the patients who don't get controlled. Please don't give them diltiazem. Please avoid diltiazem because you have no idea what's underneath that atrial fibrillation. We've already had three deaths from people giving diltiazem when they don't know the patient. So avoid that. Give a beta blocker IV. You're not gonna hurt anybody by giving a beta blocker IV. We wanna control the blood pressure and we wanna figure out if they need to be revascularized. We have to do it. So many patients we send to the cath lab or we do a stress test, a viability study to see how much is alive. And aldosterone antagonism is such a good drug. And it's 10 cents, 15 cents a tablet for 25 milligrams. And it's an antifibrotic drug. It lowers blood pressure and it's a helper diuretic. I use it a lot in combination with furosemide or torsemide. I like torsemide better than furosemide. And I use it in combination to get into those legs when these CEFPEP patients come in with these big legs full of fluid, it works beautifully, but you have to give a BID or a TID. And so for pharmacologic therapy, ACE inhibitor or ARB, so if somebody is a truly ACE intolerant, and be careful what you write on charts. We find a lot of our house staff write ACE allergy. Allergy because they dropped their blood pressure a little bit or their creatinine went up, that's not an ACE allergy. An ACE allergy is angioedema. That's an ACE allergy. Or severe cough. That's an allergy. Don't be giving patients allergies that they don't have because then when they can get the drug, somebody reads allergy and they can't give it anymore because now you've made a part of the record. Beta blockers. What beta blockers? Succinate, metoprolol succinate, not low pressure, not metoprolol tartrate, metoprolol succinate, bisoprolol which is an awesome beta blocker, and it's cheap and it's generic, and we have it in the States. And third, carvedilol. Nothing magical about carvedilol, even though a lot of people think it is. Nothing magical. All three of them lower mortality. And then diuretics is needed. So for every level of heart failure, we have things to do. And we used to wait to give spironolactone for the very, very sick, now we have data that tell us that class twos, the walking wounded, should be on spironolactone. So my typical cocktail is either an ACE or an ARM, a beta blocker, spironolactone, and diuretics as needed. And of course, the patients are on other things. They may be on diabetic drugs, they may be on inhalers, they may be on uh, aspirin, plavix, but those are the basics. And then for African-American patients, hydralazine nitrates, and that combination is approved by the FDA on top of everything else as a vasodilator and as an additional drug for heart failure, and it's approved for African-American patients. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the newer drug of Aberdeen and the newer drug, the ARNI, as we call it, the Secubitril Valsartan. <laughs> so for device, what do we do? Well, if the ejection fraction is less than 35, and you have truly, truly medicated that patient well, and I don't mean two and a half of an allopril, and 3.125 of carvedilol, which is placebo, because it doesn't give you any blood levels. That's not well medicated. I mean, really well medicated. And in three months, you can't reverse that patient. Time for a defibrillator. And that's the way that we use the defibrillator. If they have a left bundle on their EKG and are dyssynchronous, which is something your echo lab can help you and tell you, then resynchronization therapy may be the right thing to do for that patient. And by the way, women do better with resynchronization therapy than men. So at every level of this vicious cycle that I started with, we have drugs. And that's how the pharmaceutical industry has worked heart failure. They look at what the abnormalities are and where they need to block it. So our targets are angiotensin, renin. We have a renin inhibitor called aliscarin, which really hasn't made it big anywhere and has an indication for hypertension, but not an indication for heart failure. Then we have all the ACE inhibitors. We have the ARBs. 
We have the beta blockers that work not only on the heart but also on the kidney. We have the aldosterone blockade, two of them on the market, spironolactone and aplerinone. Aplerinone in the United States is a little bit more expensive <clears throat> than spironolactone. And the ones that reduce mortality, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, Look at the beta blocker reduction in mortality, it's 34%. It's impressive. And with an aldosterone inhibitor added, 30%. Why aren't we using these drugs when we have them and they're cheap? 10 milligrams of enalapril twice a day for two weeks is four bucks at Walmart. Very inexpensive. Carbetalol is four bucks at Walmart. So these drugs, even if your patients don't have a prescription plan, and if they can afford $4 here and $4 there, you can medicate them. And spironolactone, like I said, is 10 or 15 cents a tablet. And I guess the prices here are very similar. I just quoted the prices in New York and in Ohio. That's what I gave you. Okay. And we, through the years, have been adding these medications. So when we studied the ACE inhibitors, all that we had was digoxin and a diuretic. And then when we studied the beta blockers, the patients had to be on the ACE inhibitor. So we've been adding the drugs as we learn. And once you have a new study, you've got to be able to use the right drugs. You can't go into the FDA and say, I'm going to use a brand new drug and I don't need to use any of the old drugs as background therapy. except versus cubital valsartan, which is coming. So devices, ICDs, very significant mortality benefit, particularly in patients who are ischemic. Less of the data, but I still go with a very big trial called SCUTHEFT, showing that the defibrillator worked whether the patient was ischemic or non-ischemic. And if the patient is really that sick, and you think that they may not make it for six months, do you really want to put a defibrillator in? Something to think about. And if you're sending a patient home on a home inotrope like dobutamine or milrinone, heaven help us, you're actually increasing their mortality and increasing their chances of sudden death. Do you really want a defibrillator firing on them? Things to think about, and all those statements are in the guidelines very, very clearly. So what are the new drugs that are out there? So for years, we haven't had an exciting new set of drugs. And now we have two, and I can tell you we're working on a third one. And there's a fourth one out there that we're working on for diabetics. So it's, it's really an exciting time for us to see new stuff. So Evabradine, my EP people love Evabradine, because all Evabradine does is it works on an F channel which stands for the funny channel, and it slows down heart rate. That's all it does. Has no effect on blood pressure, has no effect on arterial vasodilatation. All it does is it slows down the sinus rate. And so this particular study called SHIFT, in case you get the Amgen, this is an Amgen drug, in case you get the Amgen people coming to, to talk to you about it. The SHIFT trial was done totally outside of the United States. They had Europe, they had South America, they had Canada, and very much on purpose, the company did not include the United States. So this trial has no Americans, and therefore, no true African Americans either. And African Americans may behave differently with different drugs. And they screened 7,000 patients, randomized 6,500, which is pretty good, to this drug of averaging five milligrams twice a day and then up titrating, or to placebo, and they allowed the patients to be on an ACE or an ARB and a beta blocker. And what they saw was that the quality of life data from a questionnaire, do you guys ever use these questionnaires on patients? They're quality of life questionnaires. This is called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. It's probably the most popular. Do you guys own them? No, yes? I see one person shaking her head. Let me tell you, these are highly valuable little instruments. It takes a patient eight minutes to fill out, that's all. 
And by the range of numbers, it tells you a lot about that patient. And it's prognostically important. I work for the FDA and devices, and we have now approved this instrument, the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire for companies who are coming with a new device that they want to have approved. They don't have to show us that the KCCQ works, we already know. But anyway, with the drug, the quality of life improved more in the overall score and in the clinical score. In other words, patients felt better and could do more. And the heart rate went down. That's exactly what you expect the drug to do. So the patients who took the drug had a lower heart rate than the patients on placebo. Right? What is that heart rate reduction? If I pack up trial after trial, there is a relationship between heart rate and mortality. So regardless of what trial you're looking at, heart rate elevation is not a good thing. And in the trial, in fact, the heart rate came down. And it came down in terciles. So these patients had the lowest uh, heart rate change with an event, and these patients had the highest. Now, what do you think was going on with the beta blockers? Well, if you had a beta blocker on board, you had a higher chance of having bradycardia. So it's, it's logical. Hypertension, almost identical. Atrial fibrillation, and there's something that can happen in the eye called phosphogenes, little changes in the eye. That's one of the side effects of evabradine. But you have to be on it for quite a while. So when now we're doing a trial called PrimeHF, and we're giving the drug to the patients before they leave the hospital in a randomized fashion. If the heart rate is over 77, then we can randomize them to receive the drug or not. Now, what does this cost? Evabradine, $12.50 a day. And let me show you, I think I've got the shift trial in here. Let me go back. This particular trial, the first one that I showed you, the shift trial, actually improved hospitalizations. So the drug is approved by the FDA for patients whose heart rates are greater than 77 in spite of a beta blocker that has been optimized, and I put it in quotes, because 50% of the patients in this trial were not at 50% of the maximum dose. And when I really beta block somebody, the heart rates are down in the 60s. Yeah, so heart rates in the 60s with a good blood pressure, it's fine. So that's how the FDA approved it. It's not approved for mortality. It's approved for reduction in hospitalizations. And they approved it based on the shift trial. So we're doing this trial with Duke to see if US patients, specifically African Americans, respond well to the drug. And we're only giving it to the patients like the FDA approved it, heart rates over 77. So again, the, the indication is risk of hospitalization for worsening heart failure. Who are they? They're stable. They have to have an ejection fraction below 35, so this is truly HEF-REF. And they must be in sinus rhythm. Typically, these patients are already on a beta blocker. Next drug that we got excited about was the ARNI. And the ARNI is Secubitril Valsartan, or as Novartis knew it, LCC-696. This drug is $12.50 a day. What does it do? It's a combination of a nephrolysin inhibitor. So remember I told you bradykinins are vasodilators? So when they break down, you have less vasodilatation. So this, this nephrolysin blocks the peptides from breaking down. So what are you going to see with BMP? BMP is actually going to go up, right? But pro-BMP will go down because neprolysin doesn't act on pro-BMP. But that's an important thing to think about. So the NT pro-BMP is still something you can measure. And then the other side of the drug is Valsartan, an ARB, that is approved for ACE intolerant patients and is approved post-MI as not superior but also not inferior to an ACE inhibitor. And it's this combination that has both vasodilatation and blocking of the vasoconstriction of the AT receptor together in one drug. 
And the big trial was Paradigm, and Paradigm had 8,000 patients. This is all over the world, very few patients in the United States. We're not doing well in the United States recruiting in trials. This is some work that we're all doing, because I don't think we're doing well recruiting. But very importantly is that there was a run-in period. So the patients were tested on the drug and on the comparator, which happened to be an alpril. So the patients already could tolerate the drug or they could tolerate an alopril, and they could tolerate an alopril. And then they were randomized to, with a maximum of 200 BID of the circubitral valsartan and 10 milligrams twice a day of an alopril. And I have to say here that 10 twice a day is not my top dose. My top dose is 20. And in some patients, I've gone higher than that. So 10 to me is still underdosed. But that's the way the trial was done. And sure enough, the, the, the ACE inhibitor improved mortality if you used a placebo mentality for placebo. It's called a putative placebo. But the Secubotril valsartan did it better. And the study was so powerful that it got stopped early for mortality and for hospitalizations. And every single one of the endpoints was positive for the drug. But again, remember, these were patients who were already able to take the drug. They tolerated it, and they tolerated an ACE. And the symptoms got better. So symptoms stabilized, symptom frequency got better, symptom burdens got better. And this was all measured by that same Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. So the drug got approved for heart failure, for chronic heart failure. These were not patients who were coming into the hospital decompensated. This was an outpatient study. We are now doing the inpatient study, which is called Pioneer, for patients who do come in decompensated. So an important question to look at is what happened to side effects. The biggest side effect of that drug is hypotension. And people are learning to use it by cutting back the diuretic. So when the patient drops the blood pressure, the diuretic gets cut back. Guess what? That's what we've been doing for 20 years with the ACE inhibitors. It's exactly the same thing. I always cut the diuretic in half when I double the ACE. It's force a habit, and it's the way we teach. Double the, the ACE or the R, cut the diuretic in half. And you won't get those problems with hypotension. <laughs> And you'll also avoid a lot of the renal issues as well. Potassium went up with both drugs, a bit more with enalapril. Creatinine went up a bit more, but also went up with the, with the drug. Cough was present in both, but more so with the ACE inhibitor. But the discontinuation was not bad. But more people were discontinued from the ACE inhibitor, and that's very common. I see that every day. Everybody gets afraid of that creatinine, and they stop the drug, which is not what you should be doing, because that's not AKI. That's an effect of the drug. And if you wait 48 hours, it comes right back up again. So you're, you're not going to kill anybody. You're not going to put anybody on, on dialysis. Use the drugs. My favorite editorial, and I'm happy to give the reference, is called Treat the Heart, Don't Mind the Kidney. And that's essentially what we're trying to do, is treating the heart. And yeah, the creatinine may go up a bit. That's fine. But we look at the potassium. So potassium for me is very important. And I look at the potassiums very, very carefully. So the tips to use, if you want to reduce the risk of death and hospitalization further, which is the way it's in the guideline, beyond the ACE or the R, then that may be a patient you want to switch. Make sure that their insurance covers it. A lot of insurers don't cover it, $12.50 a day. And I'm finding many of my colleagues started and they leave the patients on the low dose. <laughs> if you're going to leave them on the low dose, put them on an Alpro, which is a heck of a lot cheaper. So this, this low dose business, you know, I, I, I have a problem understanding. Patients who have a history of angioedema are not candidates for this drug and should not be put on it. You can't use it with an ACE inhibitor. As a matter of fact, you have to hold the ACE inhibitor for like one and a half days before you start the drug to make sure that the ACE inhibitor has washed out. 
because then you're going to have a higher incidence of angioedema. So the initial dose recommended is 49, 51. 49 means the Secubitril side and the Valsartan side. Is anybody, in, oh, I'm going to quiz our pharmacist. What was the dose of Valheft? What's the Valsartan dose of Valheft? See, you're off the hook. I'm quizzing the pharmacist, huh? 160, 160 BID was the target dose. So the highest dose of Secubitril Valsart is, as if it were, 160 of Valsart twice a day. And so to put it in the context of the drugs that you now know and, and understand and use. And they recommend up titrating, look for angioedema, hypotension I think has been the biggest issue, cut the diuretic in half. Um, because the drug hasn't really been tested for breastfeeding, should be discontinued, so should the ACE inhibitors be discontinued, and not recommended for liver impairment. Monitoring renal function and potassium, we do that anyway, something that we follow. So one more thing that I want to talk about is potassium. How many of you love kx -Late? I don't think anybody loves Kaxalate. Kaxalate, I don't know if any of you realize this, has a black box warning from the FDA because it causes craters in the colon. Right? So we don't use, we don't use Kaxalate much anymore, unless you've got somebody acutely coming into the emergency department, and then you can give them the GIK cocktail, you know, glucose, insulin, and get rid of the hyperkalemia. So this, I have no stock in anybody, I'm saying this right up front. I love this drug. It's called Petirimer. Petirimer is a potassium binder orally taken. It's a little powder, comes in a little envelope, and you mix it in about 100 cc's of water. And it can be given once a day in between other drugs, and within 12 hours the potassium comes right down. I have been able, and notice in this particular study, the potassium remained controlled out to a month. So I have patients now chronically on pterimer, and guess what? I've been able to give them spironolactone, and I've been able to uptitrate their ACEs and their ARBs. Who are these patients? Many of them are diabetics who probably have renal uh, tubular acidosis and are the people most likely to get hyperkalemic. But I know that a lot of my house staff will avoid the drugs because they don't want to see the potassium rise. So when you come in and you say to them, what do you do for hyperkalemia? Oh, I don't see hyperkalemia. Of course you don't, because as soon as the potassium bumps, you remove the drug. Now, what we don't know yet, and hopefully we're, gonna, we're doing a study, so we're going to find out, is that if you get the potassium down, and then you're able to put the patient on spiro or increase their ACE or ARB, are you going to have the same mortality reduction? In other words, is the part of the mechanism of the drug the fact that it raises potassium? Still to be known that I'm happy that I can put the patients on the drugs they need because I can control their potassium. Side effect profile, little constipation. That's about it. It is also expensive. But if you want to use it, you can have your pharmacist fill out. There's one form that can be filled out for the insurance to have it covered. And it needs to be in the refrigerator at home. Started out with the specialty pharmacies. Now it's at CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid. So it's at the commercial pharmacies. So where are we going with this heart failure business? Our hospitalizations are going up. I just told you how many I have. Every month, I, I run the cardiology division in our second hospital. I have between 250 and 290 heart failure patients admitted per month at that one of our three hospitals. So hospitalizations are going up for both men and women, first and second hospitalization. Our ED is a mess, and 97% of the patients who show up in the ED get hospitalized. So now we are running a, a list of patients that we call our frequent flyers. You know, it's like United Airlines frequent flyers. So we have our own frequent flyers, and they earn their flyer miles by having more than one admission in six months. And they get on the list. And so when they hit the door, something, do you guys have Epic here? What's your, uh, Cernier, huh? 
Okay, so both, both of them have this. Your list will pop up. So the patient hits the door and now you see Mrs. Smith is part of the readmissions reduction program. And when we know that, we immediately launch a whole series of consults. And now I have a rule that anybody who has an ejection of less than 35% gets seen by the heart failure team. I've sat down the private cardiologist and I said to them, this is the way it's gonna go. It is not because I don't trust you, because I don't think you're doing right. No, 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 no. It's because this is now a hospital mandate because the hospital is losing money and they've been sending back 3% of Medicare earnings every year. So right now, look at, look at these numbers. I mean, to me, it's embarrassing that one out of four patients would come back in 30 days. I'm embarrassed as a clinician that the patients come back and that they come back so often. And I'm also embarrassed at the fact that about 50% of the patients will not have a visit with a provider within 30 days. So we also have a rule. Anybody goes home from decompensated heart failure, they get seen within seven to 10 days by a provider. And for us, one of our providers is the pharmacist. And we have three pharmacists with two pharmacist clinics. I call them brown bag. Because we say to the patient, put all your medicines at home under the sink, in the medicine cabinet, by the coffee pot, in your shoe boxes, put them in a bag and bring them in. And we have found that the minimum number of drugs the patients go home with is 13. You tell me how you can take 13 drugs in a day. You will spend your entire day taking pills. So by the time they leave our pharmacist clinic, they're down to eight. And you know what our readmission rate is in that clinic? 8%. We're writing the paper now. And it's identical to what I had in Cleveland at the Cleveland VA was 9%. So that visit by the pharmacist is an incredible visit where the pharmacists spend an hour with each patient and we go over our education booklet because most admissions can really be prevented if you can get them early. And by two weeks, they're already in the hospital. Got to get them in that seven to 10 days. And we know that some of them don't stick to their diet. You know, I hear the Chinese food, the Thai food, the Japanese food, the Spanish food, every food with high sodium, that's, that's the reason they're in. They don't take their medicines. You really think that the patients are taking one drug three times a day? Think again. They skip the drugs and they lie to you if you don't ask them the question right. So I, I don't ask anymore, have you been taking all your meds? My question is, in a typical week, which one are you likely, you know, to forget, ignore, you didn't have time? And so when you put it that way, you tend to get the truth out of them, that they're not taking their drugs. And sometimes they wait until I leave the room. And they'll say, oh, by the way, I haven't been taking this for the past, you know, two, three weeks. What scares me is this one, the inappropriate medication. When the patients leave us, and then they go see their diabetologist or their primary care or their nephrologist and the drugs get stopped and then the patient gets sick and nobody's communicated that. And you would hope that the electronic medical record would help, but it doesn't always. It is not infallible. And that's a problem. Or they're given, like I said, diltiazem with an injection fraction of less than 35. You want to kick the heart down, give it diltiazem. So we, I'm trying to work with our ED not to do that. I'd rather they call us, we'll go down, we'll see the patient. If I have to give them IV metoprolol, I will. Avoid the drugs that worsen ventricular function. And of course, there's patients who don't call you. So we call them. And so we have them on a routine that if the nurses haven't heard from them, we call them. And I try to see the patients early, earlier in their course every two weeks so that I can up titrate them. And I can give, I, I have a stash, literally a stash that the hospital would probably kill me if they see. I have a stash of Lasix. So I can give them IV Lasix and then see them the next day. That doesn't mean you see them in two weeks. You see them the next day. Because when they come in the hospital, what are they getting? They're getting Lasix. And then everything else is being pulled away. I'm not gonna pull it away, it's the time I go up on doses. 
Give them the laces, but go up on everything else. Measure their pro BMP and then I see them the next day. So these are really hands-on patients. You can't let them float around. When they float around, they get in trouble. So we don't let them float around. We know that patients, we don't like to call it adherence. We now call it non-persistence. That's the fancy name for not taking the medicines persistently. And we're in the process of writing a paper for the American Heart Association on medication adherence, where we're gonna discuss a lot of these issues. But look at the numbers. This is done in Denmark where they have, it's a small country, they have a very tight a census system. So they can get all the medications put into these databases. And at five years, 83% of the patients who 100% were on statins, only 83%. 79% of those 21% have stopped their ACE or their ARBs. 35% have dropped their beta blockers and 44% have dropped their spironolactone. So we know that across time, the drugs tend to drop off, which is so important to see them. So I have a gentleman, I end up through all these years, I've had a lot of um, prison guards. I don't know if there's something about prison guards that they get sick. I had a prison guard who had his MI December 25th, two years ago sat at home with chest pain for two years because he didn't want to leave the Christmas holiday cheer, even though his poor wife was yelling at him. Finally comes in, myocardial infarction. We did a PCI, but it was already probably too late. Ejection fraction, 35, 36, 37. I have him super well medicated. Ejection fraction, 45, 50. He comes back in and I get his repeat echo and it's now 30s again. Like when I said, what did you do? He said, oh, I felt so good, I started skipping around the medicines every other day, take them every other day. So now he's found religion, and he wants to have another echo, and my secretary said, you can't have another echo unless you come and see her. <laughs> he's not very happy about having to come and see me. So he had to get back on the drugs. So. He made believe to me that he was taking everything until the echo didn't lie. The echo told me he, stopped, he you know, decreased his drug dosages and some days wasn't taking them at all and his ventricle didn't like it. So the lesson here is don't stop the drugs. Even when the patients are looking good and the pump has improved, you don't know if those genes that turn that on is still sitting there. Don't stop the drugs. You can make life easier for them. I do stop the diuretics. I have a lot of patients totally off diuretics. And they only take them when they gain three pounds in three days. That's it. Diuretics stimulate the whole neurohormonal cascade. That's why they're not good agents. And if there's no volume overload, they don't need the diuretic. So in a good clinic, you can really, really do that and keep them off the diuretic. And they're very proud of it, you know, when they haven't needed the diuretic because they've been really good with their diets and they haven't gained the five pounds, they're very happy that they can control the diuretic. Let's see what else I wanted to tell you. Uh, spironolactone, every time you see a patient, think of what's the next thing you can do. We're now up titrating spironolactone, 25, 50 milligrams a day. And if I want to get into that third space, I give it BID or TID, just like my Liver colleagues have been doing for years for ascites. Spironolactone is given BID and TID for ascites Co in combination with a loop diuretic. And my cocktail, which is what the house staff calls it, the cocktail, half an hour to an hour before the Lasix or the torsamide, they take the spiral and put their legs up. And in 48 hours, the faucet's open. And this works even in patients whose creatinines are abnormal. I'm not gonna say the people with creatinines of 10 who are on dialysis, but the patients who are still urinating and their creatinines maybe CKD two or three, this combination works. And the patients at first don't believe it, but it works. And what do I wanna keep the potassium at? I like to keep it around five. When it gets to 5.6, 5.8, then I get nervous. Five probably a good potassium, and I think it's protective of arrhythmias. So we do have gaps, 
And to me, the biggest gaps is that we are not using the right drugs. And we're not using them in the right doses. We're removing them when we shouldn't due to fears that are really not founded in the literature. And that's the biggest gap that we have. And you know, you can't keep blaming the patients. When I got to the Bronx, everybody said, oh, the Bronx population, they don't take their medicines, they don't eat right, you know, they don't show up. Stop blaming the patients. I think it's time for us to look at how we dose medicines and how we educate the patients, which is something that we do at every single visit. So I'll stop here. We're right on time and maybe have a few minutes for questions. I want to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry? Do you run an outpatient clinic? Well, that's what we have, yeah. Okay, it's not admissions. Yeah, we have three, three of us. There's seven of us heart failure people, but at my hospital, there's three of us. And then I have the three pharmacists. Uh, and it took me a year to train you guys <laughs> to think like me so that they have, I have a collaborative agreement with them, so whatever they do, I back them up. And they're good, they're very good at it. And now I'm getting the data back that the patients who are doing the best, we've had our 8% readmission, no mortality in 90 days from the group that comes to clinic. And I'm finding that the up titration of the drug is one of the key ingredients. Because we don't just med rec, we med rec and up titrate. So if the patient comes in on five of an allopril, they go up to 10. And if they don't come in on, on spiral, we put them on it. What about insurance coverage on that? Unfortunately, New York does allow pharmacists to bill. My hospital hasn't figured out how to do it. We figured it out in Ohio. They couldn't figure it out in New York. But I don't know what Alabama rules are for pharmacists if you can bill. Because if you can bill, you can bill for the visit, just like NPs can because you'd be considered a provider. Yeah, and we, we've just reached the provider status from the state. Pharmacy. Great, so you, you should be able to, to bill. So start the brown bag clinic. I can, you can come and visit. I'll pair you up with my pharmacist. I have one of them writing papers for me. <laughs> she, she's so smart, she's writing papers. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right, so the, the, the African American patients do respond to the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. But the study that looked at the combination of hydralazine and nitrates was only on African Americans. It was called AHEFT. And they had a reduction of 43% mortality reduction, which is so impressive. Unfortunately, the combination has not been used well. Only about 11% of the patients around the country who should be on the drug are. Some of it is the docs don't think about it. The drug company doesn't really push the drug anymore. And we have hydralazine and nitrates, which you heard from the pharmacists here, that that's what they use here, which is really not the same, but you can think that, well, if I give an Imdur a day and hydralazine is still three times a day, no matter what you do, that the patients won't take the drug. But it is a powerful combination and it works on top of the ACE, beta blocker, et cetera. That's how it was studied. So it's just our bodies respond better? Than well, we think that African Americans respond differently and lack nitric oxide. So it's the nitric oxide as a vasodilator. And that's what the nitrates and the hydralazine do is they promote nitric oxide. And most heart failure in African Americans is hypertension, including the kidney and stroke. And you must have a real issue around here with hypertension, I would think, because you have a big African-American population in Alabama. I mean, I look at differences in the states with get with the guidelines, so I know what you guys are doing. So you have to get really aggressive with the blood pressure. And it works. I mean, it works. We've got the numbers. It works. But, and and I have, I have African-American patients that I have them on three or four drugs to get their blood pressures down. It could be one pill that has both medicines in it, but they have to take one pill three times a day 
or the maximum would be two pills three times a day. So you can't get away from the three times a day because nobody is interested in making a BID hydralazine. That's, that's the truth. There's no pharmaceutical company that is interested in making a, a BID hydralazine, which would be a huge blessing because at least we have Imdor that's once a day. It's a mononitrate. We think it works. We're not sure. But the combination can be very powerful. I use it. On, once I have somebody in African American really ace or arbed well, beta block, and on spiral, then I'll tack that on if they're still symptomatic. So what milligrams? You start at, if you're going to do hydrolysis, start at 25 TID, bump it up to 50 and 75. And for Imdur, you can start at 30. And you can go up to 60 or 90, depending upon how much blood pressure room. When they're in the hospital, it's a great time to do it because now you have, they are getting the drug because the nurses are giving it to them. So they're getting the drug. It's a great time to do it, to start them on it. Do you use the quality of life survey as a predictor of readmission? Yes, I do. I do. It's a huge predictor. And we actually own the grading scale. We pay, I think it's like $5,000 a year to QCOR, uh, which is sort of like a little company, I might say, that owns the KCCQ. And so we have the ability to grade it. And so when the patients do it in our brown bag clinic, I have everybody's brown bag clinic, KCCQ. And I'm seeing numbers in the low 60s, high 50s, which is very bad. The higher the number, the better the quality of life. So I use that along with the pro BMP as predictors. Interesting. Good question. You guys have a heart failure clinic? Time to get one. You can run it with pharmacists and nurses together. I'm serious. You can do it with pharmacists and nurses. And the patients would love you. What do you use for education? For patient education. We, we have a standard booklet, heart failure booklet. Yours? It's one, yeah, one we created. You program. created it, okay, okay. And then we have a transition program where we make post-discharge follow-up calls, which is kind of working on the thing at the end of it instead of the... Exactly, call. exactly. You know, we're, we're calling them after the hospital. Sure, sure. Do you have a heart failure specialist here? You have a heart failure cardiologist. We're different. We're boarded in heart failure. I know. I know. I don't. I, I know everybody at UAB. My buddies all at UAB, but I didn't. I didn't know if you had a heart failure specialist. Because we take another set of boards beyond cardiology to do this. We're we're all heart failure boarded, and we do work differently. We're very different than the general crowd. We are. Yeah. My, my colleague, I remind them all the time <laughs> that we are different. <laughs> Thank you. You guys have been a great audience. <laughs>